Welcome back to yet another topic for our discussion on Paul's understanding of Christ or what we call Pauline Christology. As we study Paul's letters, we understand one thing for sure that post Damascus experience, Paul's understanding of the Messiah as he held in his uh, Jewish way of thinking earlier has now undergone some serious change as in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians Paul says that earlier we understood him from human point of view but no more we do that way. It clearly implies that now with the new encounter with Christ after knowing him personally, the Jesus whom he thought as the one who has died upon the cross as a cursed figure is now changed into or newly understood as the resurrected Messiah for whom Paul has been waiting as a faithful Jew and has been working towards to establish his kingdom. Paul's Christology has frequently been discussed in many ways and Paul, people have in the past tried to reconstruct Paul's understanding of Christ um, by comparing the data that one gets out of Paul's letters with various other sources. Um, one of the important ways and the earliest was to, in the modern critical studies, was to um, take Paul's understanding and uh, take it into the Hellenistic context uh, and then to see that when Paul calls Jesus as the Lord, uh, what did he mean and how the Lord term was understood in the Hellenistic world, in Hellenistic philosoph philosophical and in, the, um, in their religious thinking how it was understood and then to compare that uh, with Paul and to see Paul in the light of that and then try to explain what they, how did Paul understand Christ Jesus. That was the um, trend in the beginning of the 20th century with uh, William Bossert and others you know, following him who tried to explain Paul and his understanding of Christ in the Hellenistic background. But then later on we find that the trend uh, slowly took a change and uh, slowly people began to realize that uh, it is not necessary to go to the Hellenistic background to understand Paul and his understanding of Christ uh, better. What we need to do is that now we need to get back to the Jewish background itself and that is sufficient for us to understand how Paul probably um, thought about Jesus as the Christ and the, how he understood Jesus as a historical figure and Jesus after his resurrection and ascension or G, uh, Jesus as the one who appeared to him on the way to Damascus. Um, in the Jewish background whenever Paul is understood or his, uh, or his understanding of Christ is um, explained, what it means to say is that um, Paul's understanding is now compared with his Jewish understanding of Messiah. Um, in his pre-Christian uh, pre um, lifestyle and then to explain um, that how much it is similar to the previous understanding and after Damascus experience as a Jew, what did he feel different about now this Jesus? That is two dominant ways of explaining Paul's Christology. At this moment, I am not uh, getting into this kind of a explanation that from where he draws and how much he draws and is it Hellenistic or Jewish but we know one thing for sure that uh, you know now the dominant trend among the scholars is to understand Paul against the Jewish background and that is perhaps uh, quite a lot sufficient for us to uh, recognize how well has Paul or how distinctly has Paul understood Jesus and how we should understand his words as he uh, as his understanding reflects in his letters. What is now important for us, it's not to um, give a very detailed explanation of Paul's understanding of Christ because that is not possible in a short video. Uh, but I want to lay down some essentials, uh, some essential things in relation to Paul's understanding of Christ and rest uh, 
uh, we shall discuss it in the class and then we will try to understand by taking passages and explaining it and discussing it we will try to understand uh, in some more depth uh, what did Paul mean by each of these things so in this uh, what we are, video what I am trying to do is that just to put the most essential elements of Paul's Christology uh, as much as possible together so that you get an overview and then remaining we shall take up in the class um, Paul's understanding of Christ is important for us because um, if Jesus whom he met on the way to Damascus is not the Messiah um, or if he is not the one for whom he was waiting then um, we have no reason to uh, we, uh, we do not have a valid reason to think um, you know why Paul um, is willing now to allow such a major transformation in his life and uh, take a new course of journey from that point onwards it is clear for us that for Paul now this Jesus whom we met on the Damascus road is the same one who was walking on the um, shores of the Sea of Galilee and who has performed miracles who has died upon the cross and has resurrected he is the one who has appeared so let it be one thing be very clear as we discuss Jesus of history in Paul's letters and as scholars have called Christ of faith in Paul two aspects of Pauline Christology uh, let it be clear to us that we are not distinguishing these two as two separate ones rather there is a serious continuity between the Jesus of history and Christ of faith it is two forms of his existence in the earthly as well as in his uh, uh, later um, heavenly existence um, after his death and resurrection and ascension uh, one of the most important thing about Paul's Christology is that um, the story of Christ as Paul understands has got a very large impact it is related to several things uh, and Witherington puts it pretty well he says that you know the story of Christ the, the Christology of Paul is related to the story of Christ and the story of Israel the story of the world and the story of God himself what does he mean what he means to say is that Paul's Christology is connected to the story of Christ the Christ for whom he has been waiting the messianic figure for whom he has been waiting and now he encounters this Messiah and he understands him as the one who incarnated in his earthly form and then died on the cross and has now become the exalted Lord it is this important thing that Paul refers to in uh, Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 11 that is the pre-existent being becoming the savior figure in his incarnated form and then God exalting him and giving him a divine name the Lord um, and thereby he becomes the Christ the savior of the world so um, that is one aspect to which Christology is connected the another dimension to which Christology is connected is the story of Israel itself in the story of Israel we know for one thing for sure that now Jesus was born according to Galatians 4 4 Jesus was born under the law born of a woman but after his uh, birth and after Jesus is incarnated and as he dies and resurrects as Christians look at him and try to understand this Jesus's um, messiahship actually now supersedes the validity of the law itself so now for him the sonship of Jesus uh, was just another way of speaking about Jesus as that Jewish Messiah for him for whom Paul was already waiting or all other Jews of his time have been waiting for uh, for whose coming and now who has come and appeared in the form of Christ it is also related to the story of the world now right from the creation narrative onwards we understand that uh, Paul says that 
all have fallen into sin and all have sinned against God. So uh, there comes a hostility between God and man because of the sin that man has committed. But now this cosmic story um, has greater effect as a result of the birth of Christ. Now Jesus is born into this world for the redemption of the humanity from the sin and thereby the redemption is extended to the entire creation to the entire world the world that was dismissed and was given away into sin out of the wrath of god is now in christ now he is going to be it is going to be redeemed uh, forever so it is also the related to the story of god god has been working through right from the beginning till the end of the creation uh, he is at work to redeem the creation that he created in a perfect form out of sin he's trying he continuously is working and now he is now it is in christ that finally by giving his son that god the father is trying to redeem the entire um, entire world itself so it is god's story also so christology is not an isolated topic or of lesser significance christology is very important because it is the story of christ himself for whom paul has been waiting and other jews have been waiting it is a story of israel a related story of israel because god had a purpose with israel but when israel failed now as the promised messiah of israel he comes to liberate the fallen humanity and uh, offer them salvation and then it is also related to the story of the world that is now completely given up into sin and stands in hostile relationship with god the father now in christ they are brought together redeemed by god and so it is also the story of god because god as a god of mission is now involved in liberating the world from the sin clutches of sin and destruction into eternal life and into salvation into reconciled life into fuller communion with him so this is the consequence of christology it is in relation to this that we will have to understand paul's understanding of christ and how important it is and what are the different aspects of that now i want to deal today having said these general uh, details about Paul's Christology. I want to deal with uh, Christology in two different, uh, under two major topics um, that is important for our class purpose and for the understanding of students. One is the humanity of Jesus and the second is the deity of Christ. You know, in, among the Pauline scho uh, scholars in the modern times, there has been a, a, what I would call a misunderstanding that for Paul, uh, Jesus of history was not that important. All that was important for Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles or the one who was preaching the gospel of Christ is all about Jesus who appeared to him, the resurrected Lord who appeared to him on the way to Damascus. So Paul was less concerned about the historical figure and he was more concerned about the uh, divine figure, you know, post-resurrection post ascension uh, Christ Christ of faith what they called uh, but it is difficult to accept that although it is true as other scholars also have acknowledged that it is true uh, that in Paul's letters you will find very less um, his details about the historical Jesus uh, that's true there is no dispute about it uh, but um, does it allow us to say that uh, Jesus of history is less consequential for Paul's theology. I personally hold that no, um, the historical Jesus is very important for Paul in his theologization and there is no uh, discontinuity between the Jesus of history and Christ of faith. It is the one and the same person who was incarnated and now who lives in eternity as the Christ of faith. So there is no difference between the two. They are one two are one and the same so it is here that we need to understand the idea of incarnation as we talk about the historical jesus the idea of incarnation received less hearing 
than any other theological ideas in Paul's in Pauline theology. This is due to the general consensus that Paul was more concerned with the post-resurrection exalted Christ than with the pre-Easter earthly human Jesus. So there is a famous scholar named H. J. Scoops who says, Paul unlike the synoptics was oriented not by the earthly figure of Jesus but by the exalted Christ of the Spirit. Now, this kind of assumption about Paul's theology originates out of three important reasons. First one, Paul is believed to begin at the death and resurrection of Jesus when speaking of life in the spirit. Okay. The second is Paul's preoccupation to missionize Gentiles makes the human Jesus, a Jew born under the law, unimportant because his um, mission was towards the non-Jewish uh, people. Scholars think that Paul was least interested about this Jewish Messiah, the Jewishness, the historical Jesus's uh, real identity, the Jewish identity. He was less interested in that. He thought that is not important. All that important is the post-resurrection um, identity of Jesus as the resurrected and the exalted Lord. And the third is, the more crucial reason is the relative absence of evidence. Because scholars find that in Paul's letters, very less material can be found uh, which will uh, explain how he um, understood Jesus of history. But then one thing must be clear to us at this point is that uh, of course it is less but it is never absent. It is an, only when you compare with the synoptic gospels or with any other um, you know later biographical writings or any other uh, piece of work that is available to us explaining the life of Jesus or the teachings of Jesus only by comparing to that that you will find uh, Paul in Paul's letters uh, less information about Jesus of history and I feel personally that it is very normal. The reason is simple that Paul wasn't writing a biography of Jesus, a historical biography of Jesus. No, he wasn't do that, doing that. He was actually addressing to the issues that were found in the congregation that he founded in the Roman Empire. And every time he addresses those issues, he brings up uh, Jesus in his discussion, Christ in his discussion, and he only speaks that which is relevant for that context, for the church, or to deal with the issue. So one should not expect from Paul a whole lot of this detailed discussion or a lot of biographical details as we would expect from a biograph biographer or a synoptic uh, writer. But Paul is now interested in Jesus of history and while dealing with these issues in the church, wherever he requires, Paul is very quick in referring to the historical Jesus. And that is why I personally feel that uh, Jesus of history should be taken very seriously in the study of Paul. Of course, we do not find systematic presentation of the idea of incarnation or the historical Jesus in Paul's letters. Rather, there is scattered information in an incipient form that has the potential to bloom into the fullness which we see in later ecclesiastical history. Paul refers to the historical Jesus in his letters only in a scattered form as well. Nevertheless, when assembled together, these details have been seen to comprise, as A.M. Hunter would say, a brief life of Christ. For example, Paul portrays the historical Jesus as the one born out of a woman under the law in Galatians 4.4. The expression born out of a woman was familiar to the Jews and it merely referred to Jesus' ordinary humanness, not to his birth. That is what Dunn says. But one thing is clear, it is accepted that in Galatians 4.4, 4, it is to the humanity of Jesus 
that Paul is referring, if not specifically to his birth. Well, that may be disputed. However, it is clear for our purpose that humanity is referred there as a serious point when Paul is talking about, um, you know, uh, the God's offer of salvation available to the humanity. And in that story, the salvation story, the humanity of Jesus, the birth and the humanity of Jesus is so important. However, for Paul, it is not an accidental event. Galatians 4, for that which it mentions. Uh, however, as in Galatians 4, 4, he mentions, for Paul, it is not an accidental event but divinely initiated into the fullness of time. He, for Paul, Jesus descended from David, according to Romans 1.3, but as a poor man, 2 Corinthians 8.9, and indeed, in the form of a slave, Philippians 2.7, Paul says, Christ did not please himself, Romans 15 verse 3. Further, Paul mentions that Jesus was betrayed in 1 Corinthians 11.23 and he also says that he was killed by the Jews, 1 Thessalonians 2.15. But, but before that, he instituted the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11.23 following verses. For Paul, he was crucified, buried, and he rose again on the third day and appeared before many witnesses. In 1 Corinthians 15, three following verses, he says that. Paul also speaks that Jesus had apostles known as the Twelve in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, including the two named Cephas and John in Galatians 2, 9, and that his ministry was limited to the Jews in Romans 15, verse 8. Paul states that Jesus had brothers, of whom James was one, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 5 and Galatians 1 19. Paul also speaks of Jesus as meek and gentle, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1, obedient to his father, Romans 5 verse 19, Philippians 2 8, and as one who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5 21. Now when he says about Jesus as the one who knew no sin, let us underline this point that he is referring to his earthly existence, yet he is claiming that he was sinless. He knew no sin. Undoubtedly, Paul was informed of the essential details of the Lord's life, but he does not go in detail to explain all those things, everything about him, about Jesus, because that was not his primary purpose when he was writing these letters to different churches. Are there any explicit indications that Paul held to such a view about his incarnated form, his human identity? Paul defines the content of the gospel as the gospel concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. So, he is talking about the historical Jesus but believes that, according to his gospel, this historical figure who incarnated in human form, who is the son, was actually pre-existent. He was pre-existent and now he descended from David according to the flesh. So yes, Davidic Messiahship is taught here, but this Davidic Messiah is not simply a human being as probably the Old Testament people must have expected. But he is a different one who is pre-existent but now takes human form, comes in human form according to the flesh. Romans chapter 1 verse 3. Interestingly, most scholars see a reference to Jesus' pre-existence in the word. Peri tu huyu autu concerning his son in Romans 1 3. 
you can compare that with Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. The same pre-existent son of God for Paul was born under the law out of a woman. Galatians 4.4 4, or Romans chapter 8 verse 3, Philippians chapter 2 verse 7. Moreover, in 1 Corinthians 15.47, while discussing the resurrection of the human body, Paul probably alludes to the event of incarnation more directly. Why I am referring to incarnation repeatedly is because it is directly referring to the humanity of Jesus. There, Paul identifies Jesus as an anthropos, man, whose origin is out of Uranu, that is heaven. Out of heaven. Unlike the first man, Adam, who was from the earth. Ek, word is used. From the earth. So there are two different places of origin. Jesus originates from heaven, from above, and the first man, that is Adam, the earthly human being, he is out of the earth. So this is the difference. In human form, this Jesus, who is the son, he is the pre-existent being, and how does he teach? It is by saying that he is from heaven. In contrast to Adam who is from the earth. Jesus' heavenly origin presupposes this human form, his incarnation. In all pro probability, as Christian Macker maintains, Jesus coming from heaven to earth and assuming flesh and blood to share in our humanity is present in Paul's mind. So I believe with these details it is clear that Paul did accept one thing for sure that this Jesus is important for him. He cannot speak about Christ of faith without accepting the fact that this Christ of faith is the same one who lived among the people as Jesus of history. If you are interested, um, you can go and check in academia.edu uh, my article on incarnation entitled God sent his son born of a woman, Galatians 4.4. 4. The idea of incarnation, its antecedents and significance in Paul's theology uh, is posted. So if you, if you are interested, uh, probably after the class or so you can go and check and read that more and definitely it will give you more information about the humanity of Jesus, the significance. There I am explaining the significance of incarnation in Paul's theology by saying that incarnation as a dwelling of the fullness of God in Jesus. And then I um, take the second important aspect that incarnation as being sent on a mission in the likeness of humanity. And then the third thing that I highlight is incarnation and the sinlessness of the incarnate one. These are the three important significances of the human Jesus idea that I am trying to uh, explain in that article. If you want, you can check and I am connecting it with the, the then Jewish understanding uh, which uh, gives us some evidences that uh, among the Jews it was not uncommon to think of the pre-existent being taking human form. Um, so it was very common. Uh, it was possible for the Jews to think in that way. So, uh, so if you are interested, you can go and check that in academia.edu. You will find in my page that article uploaded. Another important aspect uh, that explains the importance of uh, the historical Jesus in Paul's understanding is uh, is when we look at the ethics of Paul. Whenever Paul moves into ethical exhortation and then he wants to encourage his audience, his readers to comply with certain lifestyle or to comply with certain forms of living and adopt a certain pattern of lifestyle uh, to exemplify certain virtues in their life, the sole point of reference to which he wants to draw their attention and command them to adopt that lifestyle, it is only in Jesus that is exemplified. So in other words, Jesus is the example of who 
a Christian must become according to Pauline ethics. If you remove Jesus from Pauline theology, the historical Jesus, his lifestyle, the meekness and gentleness that he is referring to and the way he humbled himself in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 following that he speaks how Christ humbled himself to bring salvation, to redeem fallen human, human race. Um, those are the virtues only visible and all those ethical principles or um, virtues that he is teaching, it is all found in Jesus of history alone. So if you remove humanity or give it less importance, then the tendency would be to lean upon some of the uh, mere Hellenistic teachings and say that, oh, he got it from there, he got it from here. Hellenistic teachings have got, or Jewish teachings have got, these are in their virtue list. So Paul is borrowing from there and using. True. It may be true that Paul knew those Hellenistic traditions about vices and virtues and Paul must have adopted something. But what did he adopt the best is what he found reflected in Christ Jesus himself. That is why in Pauline ethics, agape is so important because in the Greco-Roman world when self-sacrificial love was not the ideal um, virtue that every man must aim at possessing, it is in Christ that that self-sacrificial love that is reflected and for Paul that is the first in the list of the fruit of the spirit, agape. So we understand without knowing Jesus of history, without valuing Jesus of history so much, one cannot understand how did Paul draw these virtues uh, from the Hellenistic world and said that these are important for you Christians to follow. Even Paul's exhortation to the Philippians in chapter 2 verses 1 to 4, it again boils down to verse 5 to the mind of Christ. Okay, So that is important. Even for eschatology, Jesus of history, he died and he resurrected and his appearance to Paul convinces him of one truth that when Jesus, uh, the Son of God, intervened in the human history and he became man, actually the human history has already undergone a major transformation. As I already explained in the video on Pauline eschatology, it is Jesus when he interfered in the human history, in the decisive interference in the human history that you will find Jesus becomes the center point where the Jewish hope of the eschatological Messiah to come in the end, in the last days has now already come. So Jesus' intervention in the history is not just important for Paul in ethical teachings but also in understanding what has happened to the human history and where is it now moving. How will it take the change? What will happen in the days to come? And what has to the people, those who believe in Jesus? <laughs> Having said that, let me move now to the deity of Jesus in Paul's understanding. If the empty tomb and the resurrection appearance marks the transition from the historical Jesus to the exalted Christ, it is implied that the exalted Christ is continuous and personally identical with the historical Jesus. Paul maintained the continuity and personal identity of Jesus. While Paul had no doubt about the personal identity of the earthly Jesus and the heavenly Christ, he equally had no doubt that the heavenly Christ's mode of existence was different from that of the earthly Jesus. The earthly Jesus was man born of woman who endured a real death, but the risen Christ, while still man, was now vested with heavenly humanity, a different order of humanity from that of the present life. Then the risen Christ for Paul exists no longer in a body of flesh and blood, but in the spiritual body, as he says in 1 Corinthians 15:44. Paul may have 
been brought up to think of the day of Messiah as an interval separating his age from age to come in the Jewish understanding, the linear Jewish understanding. That is the age of resurrection. In any case, the logic of Christ event imposed such a view upon him now. Only the days of the Messiah were characterized by Messiah's reign from an earthly throne, but by his reigning from the right hand of God. Paul does not often use the expression about the right hand of God, although he uses at times. I will refer to that later. Like his fellow Jews, he knew the right hand of God to be a metaphor denoting supreme authority of Jesus. But instead of referring to Christ as being seated at the right hand of God, Paul speaks of him as the highly exalted, endowed with the name that is above all other names. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9. The name which is above every name is the designation God. It is the divine purpose, says Paul, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. So when the pre-existent figure interfered in the human history, taking the form of a human like a slave, and he died upon the cross for the salvation of humanity, God lifted him up by giving him a name above all other names, and that is the Lord. It is this Lord who is now the highly exalted figure in Paul's understanding. Paul frequently uses the metaphor the right hand of God. There in Psalm 110 verse 1, he takes it seriously as the Messianic testimony. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28, he gives a fuller exposition of it than does any other empty writers. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Paul undertakes to identify these enemies. They are not flesh and blood enemies. They are the principalities and powers that rule upon this world. And at the death of Christ, Christ the Lord has claimed victory over them. And now he is the exalted Lord who rules over all these powers and there is no challenge to his authority. It is to this exalted Lord that Paul uses the title Son of God. The title Son of God is also given to Jesus in a distinctive sense in resurrection. He was designated Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead in Romans 1 4. In Paul's thought, of course, he did not begin to be the Son of God at the resurrection, but during his earthly life, he was the Son of God, comparatively speaking, in, a, in weakness. But as the resurrected Lord, he is the Son of God in power. Like the title Lord, the Son of God was also confirmed by an oracular testimony. In another psalm, Psalm 2 verse 7, Yahweh addresses his anointed one by saying, You are my son, today I have begotten you. But son of God is for Paul much more than a designation with Jesus as Messiah bears in the office. It expresses the unique personal relationship with Jesus bore to God, as indeed it appears to have done for Jesus himself. So it is not just an ex officio designation, but it is a clear reference to Jesus' intimate relationship with God the Father himself. Now, 
let me refer to three important aspects where this pre-existent Messiah, pre-existent Lord, who became human and now remains to be God after his resurrection. He is the exalted Lord. One of the ways in which Jesus deity or at least his divine status becomes evident is with the Son of God title. In a number of instances he is the resurrected and exalted Christ who is in view. According to H. J. Scoops, the primitive Christian title God's Son likewise may have only implied his elevated rank as Messianic King. It was Paul who for the first time made out of a title of dignity and ontological affirmation and raised it to a mythical level of thought. For Paul, Son of God describes Jesus' relationship to God as the one who is sent. Romans 8.3, Galatians 4.4 4. The uniqueness of Paul's usage is an association between Jesus as God's Son and his death on the cross. In Romans 8.32, Paul's mention of God as who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all has more soteriological weight. Dunn finds here an echo of Genesis 22 verse 16 comparing God not sparing his son Jesus and Abraham not sparing his son Isaac. How did Jesus understand the sonship? Although Paul refers to Christians too as brothers of Jesus, it is quite clear that Jesus has primacy as son and that believers are adopted by grace into the divine family. For example, Romans chapter 8 verse 17 and 29. The distinctiveness of Jesus' relationship to the Father is clear from the way that Paul repeatedly and strikingly brackets God and Jesus together in one phrase as in Romans 1 7. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Dan observes the formula at least as used by Paul in Romans 1 3 and 4 seems to envisage a divine sonship which embraced the whole of Jesus' life, but a sonship which was also enhanced by the resurrection. Unquote. Thus, to this special relationship status is the pre-existence of Jesus affirmed in Colossians 1 as the agent of God involved in creation. A vital question here is, does Romans 1.4 present Christ as son by adoption at resurrection like Barrett that categorically denies such effort by saying we should not speak here of an adoptionist Christology for adoptionism properly speak, speaking affirms a taking into sonship of one who was not previously son so that means he is not son by adoption or at a particular point of time he did not become son but even in his incarnated form he was the son although he was Davidic Messiah in that form he connects Jesus with the Old Testament Messianic expectation still this incarnated being person Jesus is in the line of David as promised in the Old Testament, but he shares a unique relationship with God the Father as his son. According to David Benham, most scholars agree that behind at least some of these passages lie the Jewish idea of God's wisdom. In books such as Proverbs, the wisdom of Solomon and Ecclesiastes, wisdom is spoken of in personal terms as though it was a 
colleague working with and alongside God in creation and afterwards. Even Proverbs 8, 22-31 also has same idea. Probably Paul and other NT writers found this as a useful category for explaining Jesus. Jesus was not one among many sons of God but was the eternal agent of God involved in creation and destined to bring all things under God's feet in future. 1 Corinthians 15, 28 On just a few occasions, Paul may actually refer to Jesus as God. Romans 9, 5 2 Thessalonians 1, 12 Titus 2, 13 But he usually refrains from such language distinguishing the Supreme Father and the obedient Son but still seeing Jesus as in some real sense divine. Scoops accounts as Huyos Thiu, that is Son of God, Jesus appears in the work of Paul as a super worldly being, standing in closest relation metaphysically to God. The son of David in his incarnate existence, in his pre pneumatic existence, he is the son of God. For Numa, with Paul, denotes the heavenly sphere or its substance. Unquote. The next dimension to understand the deity of Christ in Paul's understanding is knowing him as the Lord. This Jesus, this Christ of faith, is the Lord. The Greek word kurios is repeatedly used. Lord is used by Paul in wide range of contexts depicting his favor for it. It was used of the masters of slaves. First Colossians 4 1 and Ephesians 6 9. Of the Roman emperors, of Greek deities, for example, in 1 Corinthians 8 5 and 6, and by the Jews for Yahweh. We can find two major connotations in Paul's usage. First, he expresses his own relationship to Jesus by addressing himself as servant or slave of the Lord in Romans 1 7 or 1 1 in Romans 1 1 Philippians chapter 1 verse 1 1 Corinthians 4 1 and secondly he uses kurios to express his conviction about Jesus. The name used for Yahweh in the Old Testament is used by Paul for Jesus Christ. In his faith confession as Jesus Christ is Lord, before whom every knee shall bow. Again we come to Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11. According to Paul, confession of Jesus as the Lord and faith in him brings salvation to one. Romans 10, 9. Thus for Paul and his church, Lord is clearly a particular important category. Paul so regularly adds Lord to Jesus Christ, particularly in the formal language of letter, letters opening and closing, is the reminder that the title is what denotes the Lord Jesus Christ special status and dignity. Resurrection was taken as a crucial event in the process of his becoming Lord. Exaltation to Lordship was the other side of the coin of the appointment of appointment to sonship in power. Romans 1 4. Thus Paul concludes in Romans 14 9. This is what Paul says. For to this end Christ died and lived again, and he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. The third important point that I want to make in teaching the deity of Christ according to Paul's understanding is the wisdom Christology. Allusions to the wisdom Christology we find only indirectly in Pauline writings, especially in Romans. In answer to the search for the thing that lies behind the idea of sending of son by God is supposed either 
as wisdom Christology or the Adam Christology. In either case, then the sending is from heaven and the mission of the sent son presumably starts from birth. In an influential article published in 1959 by Edward Schweizer, he says, the idea of the pre-existence of Jesus came to Paul through wisdom speculation. In a later article, he argued that behind the formulation, God sent his son to, common to both Paul and John, stands a Christology which seeks to grasp Jesus in the categories of the mission of the pre-existent wisdom or logos. The claim that wisdom Christology provides us with the main bridge from the earliest belief in Christ as exalted to the belief that Christ also has pre-existed with God prior to his life on earth is a substantial one. There are several following sections which can be understood in the backdrop of the wisdom Christology. 1 Corinthians 10.4, Galatians 4.4, 4, Colossians 1.15-20, 1 Corinthians 8.6 and so on. In Romans 10, verse 6 to 8, it is quite as it quite often assumed that verse 6 is referring to the descent from heaven of the pre-existent Christ, that is, to the incarnation. But here too, such considerations as can be marshaled are less than wholly persuasive and the weight of the evidence seems to point in a different direction. Even in Romans 8, 3 and 4, the thought is similar, using the verb tempo, that means I sent, but not mentioning a second sending of the Spirit as in Galatians 4, 4 to 6. Thus, the underlying theology must be the same as in Galatians that they express a wisdom Christology. One observes when this language is correlated with a similar motif in the Johannine writings, the plausible thesis emerges that talk of God sending his son became quite quickly established in early Christianity and since the Johannines there is no doubt that the sending was from heaven. It can readily be deducted that the same thought was implicit in the earlier Pauline formulation as in as the parallel with wisdom chapter 9 verse 10 suggests. Unquote. However, Dunn seems to be little skeptic of this type of Christological reading. For him, there is a danger of too much of reading into such a minor phrase, thinking that the imagery of the sun would have been integrated so quickly with that of the female wisdom and of reading back of the obviously much developed Johannine theology into a letter written much earlier. Dan suggests that instead of this, the much more established theme of sending of a prophet has to be considered. Thus, all the considered Christological titles in Paul's thought explicitly elucidate that Paul's thought of Christ as fully divine as he does in the case of Jesus' humanity. For Paul, Christ is pre-existently divine and has hypostatic union with God as the Son of God and Lord of all. Paul's confrontation with exalted, resurrected Christ on the road of Damascus had left grave imprint upon the view of Jesus as divine resulting in his unshaken affirmation of pre-existent pre-existence lordship divine sonship and heavenly existence there are there some other ways also to understand paul's understanding of christ especially the divine dimension that is to refer to several christological titles and study them one by one um, it is possible to 
get more insights by doing that. In this video, what I try to do is to give you a comprehensive presentation of Paul's understanding of Christ as a human and its value for Paul while he speaks about um, the divine Jesus and also its implications for his ethics and also for the eschatology. This is just a brief discussion and rest we shall be covering it in our class as we discuss on various passages and the exegetical study and we will try to do more there. Thank you so much.